Here's an updated look at how I like to do state machines in Godot 4. I'm going to go over some simpler starter techniques today just to get you off the ground, and in the next video I'll go in depth about techniques you can use when today's examples don't cut it anymore. Also, as a side note, if you're unfamiliar with the general idea behind state machines, I'll link to a previous video down below where I go over what they are and why you may be interested in this technique. So now, let's dive in. The simplest way to manage state is by using an enumerator to track which state you're in and branch your code using a switch statement wherever you have state-dependent logic that needs to run. There's nothing Godot-specific about this implementation, but I do want to bring it up for the sake of completeness, as it can really come in handy whenever you have an object that just needs a little organizational help. The turrets in my game Liberation Mutagenics, for instance, use this technique of state management since they only have three simple states they can be in, scanning for targets, firing on a target, and recharging. In fact, let's recreate a barebones version of a turret as an example of what we can do with this form of state management. Our turret will default to a scanning state where it waits for the player to enter its view, fire upon the player when it sees them, and then become dormant for some amount of time while it recharges before going back to scanning for the player. So here's the scene, composed of just an animated sprite 2D node for graphics, a raycast 2D node to detect when a physics body passes the turret, and a line 2D node so we can see where the raycast 2D node is scanning. Since this is a demo, we'll just change animations to show what state we're in and move on without worrying about making the player react or anything like that. And here's the code. The possible states the turret can be in are declared at the top, along with references to the nodes the code needs and a few variables to help control everything. The majority of this code is just about doing whatever each state needs to do, as there's very little overhead here. During the process and physics process calls, we run different logic depending on what state we're in, and change states via the change state function so we can handle any setup or teardown that's required when changing states, such as playing an animation or resetting a timer. This technique is simple, effective, and makes it easy to expand the codebase over time while keeping things neater than using a bunch of if statements and conditional booleans to figure out which state the object is in. It's definitely a go-to technique of mine, but when I have more than a fairly simple object or set of states to manage, I do prefer to reach for a more robust implementation, which I'll discuss now. As opposed to a purely code-based solution which you will see a lot of the time, my preferred way of implementing a state machine in Godot uses a node-based approach. This approach consists of one node managing all of the states, and a number of child nodes as the actual state implementations. The parent object delegates logic resolution to the state manager, which then delegates to the active state and handles state transitions as appropriate. You can certainly build up more or less the exact same thing using code, but I do like the node approach for a few reasons. The biggest of which is that it lets me take advantage of the features of the Godot editor. With nodes, I can export variables to easily tweak them without having to go into my code, including for connecting state transitions. Plus, I can visually inspect my state machine in the editor. These two together make it easy to reason about and adjust my state machine as I go along. This technique also lets me be lazy and reuse my states on different objects by just dragging a node into the editor and putting a script on it. And most subjectively, I just like this approach. I find it intuitive and feel that it meshes well with Godot's approach to game development. So with the why out of the way, let's talk about the how by walking through a state machine designed to control the player character in a game, since character controllers are a common use case for state machines. We'll focus on only a user-controlled player for now, as there's already plenty to cover, and making this code work for multiple entities, including NPCs and enemies, will require introducing some additional concepts that I'll talk about in the next video. So looking at the player scene, the player is a character body 2D node with a collision shape 2D node for physics, animated sprite 2D node for graphics, and the relevant state machine nodes attached to help it operate, all of which are just plain node types. The script on the player looks like this. Not a lot to it, as the player really just delegates any state-dependent logic to the state machine for further processing, such as with the physics process or unhandled input functions. It does also pass a reference to itself during the state machine initialization, so that the states can have a reference to it and therefore control it directly. There are ways around this if you don't like the idea of a child node controlling a parent, which I normally would agree with, but since the states are essentially hot swappable brains for the player, I'm okay with it in this instance. Moving one step down the hierarchy, we have the actual state machine. This component is responsible for managing the state of the parent object, delegating to the active state, and handling any state transitions that may be required. Upon initialization, the state machine passes a reference to the parent to each child state and enters the default starting state. 
And in case you're wondering, you could let the state machine reach up the hierarchy to find the parent rather than having the reference passed as a parameter to the initialization function, but that can be an error-prone design if every scene isn't structured exactly the same, so I don't generally recommend doing that. The rest of this node is essentially as you would expect with the state pattern. Each state node can optionally return a new state to transition to after processing an event. If a new state is desired, the previous state gets a chance to clean itself up with the exit function before the new state is marked as active and its enter function is called. So now let's look at what the state nodes are actually doing. At the heart of every state node is the state class. This class is never directly used unless you just wanted to have a no op state for some reason, but having class name at the top still makes it useful to us, as we'll see in just a moment. Since this class is the core interface behind our state interactions, let's break it down line by line so we can make sure we understand what it's doing. At the top, class name declares a class named state in the global namespace, which basically means we can bring in all of the code here into other scripts without having to copy paste anything or reference the exact location of this file. And it lets us make use of Godot's type system, giving benefits such as text completion, auto filtering any exported variables to the given type, and so on. Moving on to our variables, by exporting animation name, we can easily tell our state to play an animation on the player whenever the state takes over. Similarly, move speed is exported so that all of our states can have movement if desired. And lastly, gravity is loaded from the global game settings so that we can have a consistent value on every physics object. Next we come to the parent. We saw a reference to this variable in the state machine, and here's where it lives. Each state holds a reference to the player so that it can control the player as if they were directly connected to one another. Looking at the functions next, this is the meat of the state class, though it might not look like it since it's fairly sparse. Here, a default implementation for each function that may get called by the state machine is declared, with the ones that are expected to return a state if desired returning null by default, signaling to the state machine that a state transition should not occur. One thing that may stand out to you is that I don't use the built-in process, physics process, or unhandled input functions directly that come with nodes, and the reason is really just a stylistic preference. I simply prefer to use a separate function that I have defined and have full and direct control over. You can certainly use the built-in functions directly, along with a few calls in your enter and exit functions to toggle the processing of these functions on and off, but I just prefer to be a bit more explicit in what I'm doing. Which I guess means that this is a good time to remind you that options exist, there's little that should be taken as dogma, and over time you'll figure out what you like and what works best for you. And that wraps up this base state class. As we look at the other states, you'll notice that not every function here is shown again. In those cases, that's because we're falling back on the default implementation declared in this file, which typically does nothing. From here, we just need to have an instance of this class for each state along with any of the state relevant logic. To create a state, we can add a node as a child of our state machine and attach a script that extends our state class. Meaning, as we just talked about, we'll bring in everything we just looked at while also adding new functionality on top of it. To demonstrate this, let's look at the code for the idle state and break it down. At the top, extend state tells Godot that this script inherits from the state class. We then have a few exports for the states we want to transition to. Since we've typed them as state nodes, the Godot editor will automatically filter our options for us when we go to set these values. Looking at the enter function, here's where some of the magic starts to happen. The call to super means that we will call the enter function as defined in our top level state class, which, as a quick refresher, is defined as a single line that plays an animation for us. So by calling super, we can set our animation when we enter the state and still run any custom enter logic we want, which in this case is used to zero out the player's horizontal velocity. Next up, let's look at the process input function, which is looking for the player to either press the jump button while on the floor, which will send the player to the jump state, or one of the movement keys, which will send them to the movement state. And lastly, we have the process physics function, which applies gravity and moves the player appropriately, and switches to the fall state in case something happens while idle and the player is no longer standing on the ground. And that's it for the idle state. To help drive things home a little bit further on how this implementation works, let's also look at the jump state, which is pretty similar but does have a little bit more going on. Breaking it down again, you'll notice the top of the file is largely the same as what it was in the idle state. We state that we're inheriting from the state class, export the states we'll transition to, but now also export a new state specific variable, jump force, to configure how hard to jump upwards when the player jumps. When the jump state is entered, we let the parent implementation go first, setting the appropriate animation, and then set the player's vertical velocity to the jump force we defined, just flipped since y values decrease as you move upward in Godot. 
Why not just make the jump force negative from the start? Well, again, this is just a bit of a stylistic thing since I just prefer to define a force that will act on something in the positive and then orient it correctly when needed. It is perfectly valid though to just set the jump force to a negative value and skip this step. Moving on to the physics update, during the update we let gravity work its magic and switch to the fall state if the player is no longer moving upward. Otherwise, we read in the player's input to let the player move around in the air as desired, update the physics body with move and slide, and then check if we're on the floor. If so, we'll transition to a move or idle state depending on if any keys are currently pressed. If not, we'll return null and keep the jump state active for another frame. And that's it for the jump state and states in general for this implementation. I'll save you the tedium of going through all of the other states just to see more or less the same thing over and over, but if you look in the sample project you'll see a similar pattern of overriding the functions we care about, ignoring the ones we don't, and responding to inputs or events where appropriate. And so with what we currently have, you can easily set up a simple character controller to use in your game and flesh it out as appropriate. But that's about all you can do right now. In the next video, I'll show you some techniques for building a more advanced state machine that's capable of a lot more than what we've seen here.